Peace talks between Yemen's warring factions collapse as the UN warns of the looming humanitarian catastrophe. With Saudi-led airstrikes continuing under the banner of restoring hope, what hope is there for the future of the Arab world's poorest nation? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. It's nearly three months now since a Saudi-led alliance began airstrikes in Yemen. The stated objective was to drive back the advance of Houthi rebels and bring about some sort of talks. In the meantime, the UN believes an estimated 21 million people, or 80 percent of Yemen's population, are now in need of humanitarian assistance. And while there have been talks, they've come to nothing, with no sign of any agreement or truce. Paul Chadadian reports on the latest setback in Geneva. The differences between the warring factions were too big to overcome. The Houthis were determined that airstrikes led by Saudi Arabia had to stop before peace talks could move forward. But Yemen's government said the Houthis had to pull out of cities they control and stop shelling civilians before a deal could be done. And the UN wasn't able to help reconcile those differences. Unfortunately, right from the start, we never had anything solid to hold on to. We attempted to carry out these negotiations with the exiled government's representatives, and there is no way that the Houthi parties will get involved in discussion with a government which is not elected or legitimate. Both sides blame each other for not making more concessions. We were, and still we are, uh, optimistic that we will uh, go into a, a peaceful solution for Yemen. Uh, under the umbrella of United Nations. But unfortunately, uh, the Houthis uh, delegation did not uh, allow us uh, really to reach to uh, uh, a real uh, progress as we expected. But the UN envoy says a ceasefire is still possible and the door is open for further dialogue. We believe that if there is a further consultation, we can reach this possibility of a ceasefire and a, a withdrawal, accompanied by a withdrawal. There is, in principle, no disagreement on this uh, basic element. With no agreement in Geneva, it's now left to the international community to influence Yemen's key players to accept a ceasefire and stop the suffering of Yemen's people. Paul Chadurjian, Al Jazeera. Well, let me introduce our panel for this inside story. With me here is Andreas Krieg, Assistant Professor in the Defence Studies Department at King's College London. Joining us from Sana'a is Julian Hannes, Yemen representative for the UN's Children's Agency, UNICEF. And in Geneva, we have Adam Barron, Visiting Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome to you all. Before we start our discussion, let's just remind ourselves of the background to this. The Saudi-led airstrikes began on March the 26th in an operation known as Decisive Storm. Saudi Arabia spearheaded a coalition of nine allies, with the U.S. providing intelligence and logistical support. The military intervention was in response to requests for help from the internationally recognized but dis domestically disputed President Abrabu Mansur Hadi, who was driven into exile by Houthi rebels. The mission changed to Operation Restoring Hope on April the 21st, with Saudi Arabia saying its military objectives have been achieved and making this statement at that time. The Houthi forces have lost huge parts of their capabilities and we can confirm that it will not be a threat anymore to the neighboring countries or against the Yemeni people and that the Yemeni government will take all procedures to restore hope to Yemeni citizens through Operation Restoring Hope. Well, Andreas Krieg here in Doha, it would appear that that statement was somewhat premature, would it not? Well, I mean, we need to understand why the Saudis went into that war to begin with. Um, first of all, strategically, yes, the GCC and Saudi Arabia, the coalition in general, they wanted to uh, restore peace and stability in Yemen. That was a very generic strategic goal. Operationally, the goal was, first of all, to destroy their um, ballistic missile capability. And that is 
one of the that was one of the objectives that was to the to the largest extent was achieved. The second one was to basically disrupt the advance of the Houthis on the ground. That was only again partially achieved. Obviously, there is dis a lot of disruption on the ground in terms of the advance of the Houthis, um, but we haven't weren't able to defeat them. They are not defeated, and that's exactly uh, why we are in the stalemate that we're in at the moment. Well, some argue that it was an attempt to bomb them back to the negotiating table. Exactly. So the, 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 the aspect here is that you want to coerce them through military force to basically to realize that they have to re go back to, to talk to, uh, to the other side. And um, the thing is, though, that the stalemate at the moment is not ripe enough, I would argue. I think that the people, that the Houthis in particular, do not feel that they have to go and talk because they still think they can win something on the, on the battlefield. And until we get to this ripeness, I don't think people will talk. Well, Adam Barron, um, what went wrong in Geneva? Is there an aspect that everybody thinks that they are winning this and that's why the talks failed? I would certainly say that's effectively it. I think both parties in my meetings with representatives from both from both delegations, both of them really think that they are in the perfect position and don't really see a need to compromise. Uh, the delegation from Hadi's side effectively views their, their position as Yemen's uh, legitimate government as beyond question, so sees no reason, reason to compromise on anything regarding that. Meanwhile, the Houthis and Salah's supporters and other forces inside of Yemen have been almost bolstered by uh, by the fact that they managed to survive uh, the the Saudi bombing Saudi led bombing campaign until this point. Uh, in spe in meeting with Houthi delegates and delegates from Salah's party, there's almost a sense of pride. Uh, they feel as if they're winning on the war on the ground. Uh, that may be a temporary thing, but they feel as if they're still winning. So due to that, on both sides, we're not dealing with uh, with people who are ready to talk or make concessions, we're dealing with people who still think that they are winning. Well, Julian uh, Harness, we heard the UN Secretary General calling for a two-week truce, uh, a humanitarian truce. Was there any expectation in Sana that uh, this call would succeed, that you would see a truce in place? Um, well, obviously there was hope. I mean, you've got 20 million people in Yemen out of a population of 24 million who need assistance. So we really needed this truce. We will still be able to continue uh, without it to provide assistance. It's going to be much, much harder, though. Uh, one comment I'd say about the, the fighting. Um, I don't know who's winning, but I do know who's losing, and that is the Yemeni civilian population, women and children across the country, who are paying for these political and military decisions. I'm going to return to that point in a little while, but um, Andreas Krieg, uh, uh, taking a, a slightly broader look at, at, at the conflict, some have argued that it bears all the hallmarks of a sectarian mm. um, uh, conflict, pitting the Shia Houthi rebels against Sunni groups inside mm. and outside Yemen. Yet, uh, some would also argue that it's far, far more complex than that. Absolutely. I think it's a very, very simplistic view that the media has taken, because it's, it's a nice narrative. Sunni against Shia is part of this big uh, uh, regional uh, war that we're in, in general. But this is way too simplistic. Yemen has been a conflict for as long as we can think, particularly in the last 50 years. There are various fault lines running through the country that are sectarian. Some of them are uh, based on tribal lines, some of them within the tribes, between clans, some of them are ideological. There are different movements, and all these different layers basically compete with each other. So you have this very, Yemen has always been a very, very fragile construct. It's never been a state, really. It's a fragile construct of competing poles that, um, that try to seize uh, uh, control of the country. And one side or the other has always been trying to uh, trying to tip the balance in their own favor. And this is actually what the Houthis have been doing over the last uh, uh, 18 months. Well, um, Adam Barron, as, as well, the argument has been put forward that Yemen is uh, very specifically part of what could be a proxy battle involving Iran, of course, who back the Houthi rebels um, against the uh, uh, Gulf states. Uh, how accurate do you think that kind of characterization of the conflict is? I think that's a simplistic characterization. Uh, to some extent, there is the element that this is being seen, particularly on the media level. And when you look at a lot of sort of particularly media coverage of this conflict in uh, Arab media, this is often portrayed as sort of a battle between, uh, you know, Sunni, uh, Sunni Saudi Arabia and Shia Iran. I think on the ground in Yemen, it's it's far different. This is very much a political conflict, and not just sort of a political conflict on the larger level. 
it's really a series of political micro conflicts. And when you look into certain fronts where the fighting is, it's always interesting. It's not, you know, a Sunni Shia thing or an Iran back group versus a Saudi back group thing. In many cases, uh, the fighting ends up dealing with, you know, different tribes who, when you look at the sectarian profile or even sometimes the political profile, you know, different cleavages and tribes where everyone sort of has the same background, but due to whatever, due to various reasons, due to the fact that we're dealing with a turf war, due to the fact that state institutions have collapsed and we're dealing with a power struggle, uh, different forces are fighting for power. Well, Gillian Harness, I want to return to a point that, that uh, you were bringing up, the immense human cost of what is happening on the ground. Now, you've just released some figures uh, which indicate that the number of children killed in conflict over the past 10 weeks is four times the number of those killed in 2014. Those are staggering statistics. Are these attributable to the air campaign conducted by the Saudi-led forces? Well, all parties to the conflict have, uh, have been responsible for the deaths of children, both directly uh, and, and indirectly. Uh, if we look at those numbers, uh, which is 279 killed and about 402 injured conservative numbers, um, that's across the country. Um, about 65% are as a result of um, deaths in uh, airstrikes. Um, and then a, about 25% uh, uh, as a result of street fighting, mainly in the cities of uh, Taiz and, and Aden. Well, let's just pause for a moment and take a stock of just how desperate things have become in Yemen. Al Jazeera's uh, Victoria Gatimbi filed this report. Houthi rebels and forces loyal to former President Ali Abdullah Saleh shell a civilian area in the southern city of Taez. Before the fighting started, Yemen was already one of the world's most impoverished countries. Now the UN is warning that basic services are collapsing in all regions. Life here is tough. I can't even describe it in words. This is a holy month. We are supposed to feel joy, to relax with our families, but look at us. We are living in pure horror. We are terrified. My God, I tell you, it is horror. The UN has appealed for $1.6 billion to help the 21 million people who need aid. On the evidence of our own eyes, I am deliberately raising the alarm about the looming humanitarian catastrophe facing Yemen, where over 21 million Yemenis, 80% of the country's population, are in need of some form of aid to meet their basic needs or protect their fundamental rights. The situation in Yemen is dire, with supplies running low and fears of an outbreak of dengue fever. Millions of people no longer have access to clean water, proper sanitation or basic health care. The situation here is disastrous. Only God knows our true suffering. There is no fuel, there is nothing. The whole country is suffering. We can't sleep day or night. Why is this happening? Everything is expensive. We can't afford to buy food. Millions of Yemenis had pinned their hopes on a ceasefire agreement in Geneva. They want the war to end and know that until it does, their situation will continue to deteriorate. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera. Well, Gillian Harness, uh, a litany of tragedy there. And making it more difficult for you, of course, attempting to relieve the situation is that it is in an atmosphere of ongoing conflict. Are you able to do your work? Uh, we're able to get out to most of the country most of the time. Uh, obviously, in the you know the peak of the fighting in, in a city like Dave or, or districts in Aden or Taiz, it's very difficult for us to get access or us for any other actor. Um, but the majority of the country, we are able to access. The difficulty is not so much the access. The the issue is that the needs of the population have doubled or trebled uh, compared to uh, three months ago. Um, 20 million people who need water. Um, and that why is that happening? That is because commercial shipping, which would normally bring in the fuel, commercial shipping, which would normally bring in the medicines, have been severely limited by the ongoing conflict. And so the normal commercial mechanisms don't provide that. And then that responsibility falls to the humanitarians, and we're never going to be able to cover that. 
Well, uh, Andreas Krieg, complicating the situation here in Yemen is, of course, the activities of groups like Al-Qaeda in Yemen, um, who, as we've discussed, uh, often thrive on the type of chaos that you are seeing there. Does that make this conflict even more unresolvable? Well, it's another dimension to this existing conflict already. And, but we, we all tend to forget about the fact that as we are so much looking at, at, at the forces of, uh, loyal to Abdullah Saleh and we're looking at the Houthi'in and we're looking at the, the, lo the loyal forces to the government, we're not really looking at all these jihadists that have been seeing Yemen as a safe haven for, for decades. Ever since the, uh, the Mujahideen were operating in Afghanistan, Yemen has been a safe haven for these Mujahideen. So the infrastructure there is a very, very significant infrastructure that uh, any group can tap in, any jihadist group can tap into if they wanted to launch attacks towards Saudi Arabia. And we've seen recently a lot of attacks in Saudi Arabia. And I think that the, this is something that we have completely uh, uh, sidelined, but it's actually a major, a major problem because who has been thriving of all this infighting is Al-Qaeda, Ansar Sharia, which is a derivative of Al-Qaeda, and uh, even groups like Daesh who have now started to appear in, in various parts of the Hadramaut and the, the southeastern part of Yemen. So if we look forward, um, we, this is one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, in, in, in inducements for us to say we actually should stop this war because we don't want these kind of groups to be even bigger and become bigger and grow. Well, Adam Barron, uh, clearly a, a situation of chaos. Where do we go from here? Um, are attempts going to be made to get the uh, people back to the negotiating table? Do you think that that is a valid route to still be taking? I think it's very unclear. Uh, the UN envoy will be going to brief the UN Security Council uh, back in New York this week. And I also have heard, you know, you hear reports and talk of se a serious amount of US and Russian pressure being applied to both sides in this conflict to try to force there to be some sort of concessions. But I think at the end of the day, there can't be any sort of end to this conflict unless the parties involved in this conflict want to end it. And what I think we've seen in Geneva is that at this point, neither side in the conflict really appears willing to end it, at least not willing to end the conflict on terms that the other party will accept. And of course, as Julian mentioned, the ultimate victim in this is the Yemeni people. Uh, and as this conflict goes on, uh, what is an ongoing disaster will only, will only worsen in Yemen. Well, Julian Harness, what do you think needs to be done to alleviate this immense humanitarian catastrophe? I think, obviously, peace is, is our number one hope. Uh, however, whilst the conflict goes on, we need to see the parties to the conflict observing international humanitarian law. Children being killed um, in street fighting, children being killed in aerial bombardments, abduction of children, recruitment of children, attacks on schools and hospitals, all of these are condemned by international humanitarian law. All parties to the conflict need to be paying attention to this and they need to stop these abuses now. Secondly, um, parties to the conflict need to allow commercial shipping and other normal commerce to come into the country so that the Yemeni people can look after themselves. And then finally, humanitarian actors who are there to assist should be given access to all parts of the country so that we can conduct vaccinations, we can provide food and other assistance uh, and to keep Yemeni children in the, and work on their welfare across the country. You mentioned the recruitment of children. Could you explain? Yes, indeed. Um, we have been able to verify 318 children have been recruited by various armed groups uh, across the country. And, and this is really all, all armed groups uh, recruit children. Uh, there is a, a problem within Yemeni society where it is seen that any boy who reaches, say, 13 or 14, um, it is seen to be normal and accepted um, that they should take up arms. And as a result, a lot of, a lot of the armed groups are incorporating children into, into their uh, forces. In some cases, up to a third of armed groups have been observed to be, to be children. And that is completely forbidden. It should not happen. And we need to see that stopping. Andreas Krieg, I mean, there we heard the statement that there has to be some kind of international law applied that all parties to the conflict need to observe the protocols. Um, is that going to happen? Well, it is, I, I have to agree with uh, both of them. It, it is a major tragedy what's happening right now. I think all parties to the conflict realize that, the coalition realizes that. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons that Saudi Arabia was so hesitant to intervene earlier, because they knew they would get themselves into a very wicked problem. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quagmire that you didn't want to get sucked into, but now Saudi Arabia is part of it. Um, 
It is a wicked problem and it's very, very difficult to uphold international law under these circumstances. You need to understand this is an air power led operation. These planes are flying at 15 to 20,000 feet altitude. There are very few special forces on the ground who can provide the human, human intelligence that you need in order to pinpoint uh, the planes to the target, which makes it even more difficult to target. But yet you have to do something. And what uh, Saudi Arabia has done in the first phase of the operation is basically trying to destroy the infrastructure that was, uh, that was being used by the Houthis, that was being used by the Republican Guard. They've done so. And they know themselves, the Houthis know, and as well as the uh, 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 the Republican Guard know that if they position certain targets in civilian areas that you know the, they will stop the Saudis or they might uh, inhibit the Saudis to actually or anybody anybody flying in the coalition to uh, stop them from targeting these targets the issue is though that sometimes these targets are vital military targets and they need to be they need to be destroyed so it's always a judgment call it's always a judgment call and it's a very difficult one in an environment that could not be any more complex from an operational point of view you have mountainous terrain you have urban environments very inaccessible terrain and very few people on the ground who actually can give us the intelligence give the coalition the intelligence to say um, this is where the targets are so you always fly in the blind and that makes it even more difficult that does not mean you shouldn't make an effort and I, I, I can ensure that the coalition is doing anything it can in order to uphold international return law well, Adam Barron, just to, to get back to the prospect of negotiation, um, it does appear that the parties in Geneva, um, the Houthis were insisting that the bombardments stop, that the uh, conflict stop before they start withdrawing uh, from the ground that they have occupied, which is the demand of the uh, Saudi-led coalition. Um, it does appear that these sides are so far apart in terms of their demands and in terms of what they are willing to do, uh, a talking appears to be very unlikely to produce any form of result at all, does it not? I think that's true, and I think it's very notable that both delegations never even met in the same room during the Geneva consultations. That is, that the UN decided it would be best for them never to meet face to face. And if you're having talks that are not even being face to face, it really underlines the distance between the two sides in Yemen right now, uh, really, which is really something that's symptomatic of the deepening divisions in Yemeni society. You hear people referring to themselves and referring to people who used to be their neighbors, their fellow Yemenis, in stronger and uh, more antagonistic ways that you would have never seen uh, three or four months ago, let alone a year, two, three, four years ago. So what we're dealing with is not just with a you know, a, a conflict where different sides in the conflict are very far apart. We're dealing with a country that's really being ripped apart in a number of different directions. Well, Julian Harness, I, I don't think we can um, emphasize enough the human extent of this tragedy. We can talk about the political conflict, we can talk about the reasons behind it, and yet the outcome, as we've all been saying, is the suffering of people on the ground. Um, there appears to be no learning from the past, the immediate past, what happened in Syria, what happened in Iraq, is repeating itself in terms of what is happening in Yemen. Is there anything the international community can do to help reduce the suffering of the people while the political conflict is being resolved? Well, I think there's obviously uh, financial assistance uh, in order to support um, the Yemeni population and the recent um, appeal, the appeal went out uh, in the last days. So there's that. But also there's an engagement with all parties to the conflict by states um, to engage with them and to ensure that these parties to the conflict conduct their uh, they're fighting in ways which are compatible with international humanitarian law. And I would, I would challenge uh, Andreas Krieg in saying um, that, you, you know, you drop a bomb from 50,000 feet or you fire a Kalashnikov from around the corner and you do your best. No, you don't do your best. There are obligations under international humanitarian law. You take up a weapon system, whatever that weapon system is, you have an obligation to use it in a discriminate and a proportionate fashion. And attacks on hospitals, uh, blowing up of schools, um, the destruction of uh, international NGOs, warehouses, uh, blowing up of, um, of buses full of civilians, none of this is acceptable. And so I would like to see international states engage with all parties to the conflict to ensure that as this conflict goes forward, civilians do not suffer unnecessarily as a result of it. Well, at that point, my thanks to our guests, Julian Harness, Adam Barron and Andreas Krieg. And thank you for watching. As always, we would like to hear your thoughts. You can contact us on our program page at aljazeera.com. 
You can also post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or tweet us using at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mike Hanna, and the whole team here, thanks for watching and goodbye for now.